If everything goes to plan, somewhere around this time of year, next year, in the year of our Lord, 2025, we will be playing a brand new entry in the Grand Theft Auto franchise. That entry certainly seems poised to break a lot of new ground and probably turn the entire industry on its head, as the franchise has done many times before and almost without fail upon the release of a major numbered entry, at least since the release of GTA 3 all the way back in 2001. Just how much GTA 6 stands to change about the video game development landscape and industry as a whole remains to be seen, but one thing that we know for sure will be changing about the series itself is the role of half of the known population. Because for the first time in the franchise's almost 30 year history, Grand Theft Auto 6 will have at least one of its two known playable protagonists be a woman. Women, Grand Theft Auto. This is a topic which in and of itself is massive and depending on how well this does, I may just tackle because frankly, I have a lot to say on the subject. Today though, today we are going to keep it simple. As I said, the Grand Theft Auto franchise is nearly 30 years old, and in that 30 years, there haven't been nearly as many notable or interesting female characters as there have been male ones, that's for sure. But there have been plenty who are worth talking about, and as trends demonstrate, we are likely only going to keep getting more and more feminine characters worth discussing as the years go on. So let's take a look back at the ones who stuck out most to me from each game, going back through the series' long history. Now you'll have to forgive me, but I tend to often overlook the early 2D GTA games. As they stand today, they are practically a novelty. And I say this as one of those few weird people who unironically enjoys the original Fallout 1 and 2. I do enjoy old school games, but GTA 1, 2, and the GTA 1 London packs all lack in the story department quite heavily. They do have stories, but not ones I find particularly worth talking about, and thus not really any characters worth talking about either. The most noteworthy thing when it comes to these old games and good female characters is the fact that, at least in GTA 1, you could technically play as one. Among your choices were Divine, Mickey, Katie, and Ulrika, but most of the references to the player character in that game, which are implicitly gendered, imply that the canon GTA 1 protagonist is in fact male. Anyways. Let's move on to where the series' narrative streak truly began to take off, with the introduction of a fully voiced cast, and more importantly, a third dimension with Grand Theft Auto 3. GTA 3 doesn't have a lot of female characters in it worth talking about. Only a handful, really. There is Misty, one of the girls working at Luigi Gattarelli's club, Sex Club 7, Maria Latour, Salvatore Leone's dissatisfied wife, who spurs on much of the GTA 3 story by involving herself with the player character, Claude, Asuka Kassen, who is a former lover of Maria's and the sister of the Yakuza leader in Staunton Island, she also plays a very pivotal role in the story, and last but certainly not least is the character who spurs on all of the events of the GTA 3 narrative when she shoots Claude and leaves him for dead, his ex-girlfriend, Catalina. Now, this isn't meant to be a measure of who is the most morally good, or the most badass, or whatever. It's simply my perspective on who I think is the most interesting character, all things considered. And for me, I think in GTA 3, that is probably Asuka. Asuka initially plays the role of savior to Maria, and is technically some of the first sapphic representation to be seen in the series, although for less than desirable reasons. She is heavily implied to have had a relationship of some kind with Maria in the past, and that is at least partially why she is willing to risk her own life and bring Maria along with her now wanted lover, Claude, over to Staunton. During the game's second half, the player then does plenty of work for Asuka and her Yakuza, 
until she eventually introduces you to her brother and leader of the gang, Kenji Kasen. However, the player character in GTA 3 is an absolute bastard, even by GTA standards, and ends up betraying Kenji over presumably a tiny slight against his own ego. He murders Kenji, but passes it off as the work of the Colombians and provokes the Yakuza to go to war with them, now led by Asuka after the death of her brother. Asuka then plays the role of a vengeful sibling in the game's final act. She becomes the leader of the gang, which is double noteworthy, seeing as she leads the Yakuza for a good chunk of this game, and Catalina leads the Colombians, making two of the game's most powerful gangs run by women, but I digress. Asuka seems to show an actual devotion to finding her twisted version of justice for her brother's death, as well as her ruthless ability to lead and destroy her enemies as she took control of the gang and seemed to lead it with a confident and decisively iron fist. She is eventually and unfortunately killed off screen, ironically by the other main contender for my favorite female character in Catalina, but we will be seeing more of her in just a couple of games, so. GTA Vice City unfortunately sees quite a drastic decrease in the number of interesting female characters though. The only ones really worth noting are Mercedes Cortez, daughter of the ruthless drug lord and retired South American colonel Juan Garcia Cortez, the adult film actor Candy Sucks, and the old woman working as the cab dispatcher down at Kaufman Cabs. Yeah, that's that's basically it. I mean, okay, okay. I don't know, there's uh, Auntie Poulet. Ooh, there's one actually. There's um, Jan Brown, one of the guests on VCPR. Jeez, wow, the most developed female characters in Vice City are all on the radio. Not a great look. Well, for me, the choice is rather obvious, I suppose, in Mercedes Cortez. She doesn't get a ton of time on the screen to actually be developed as a character, though. In fact, she, along with most other female people seen in Vice City, is effectively only used for her sexual attractiveness. This is, of course, the elephant in the room, the actual role women have often served in the Grand Theft Auto series more often than not. It really is a whole video that I could make, hell, maybe even a whole series, but Vice City certainly is one of the worst when it comes to representation across the franchise, which makes it perhaps slightly more ironic that it will be upon our return to the South Coast next year that things will really start to change. Hopefully, anyway. Moving on to San Andreas. Once again, there aren't very many prominent or plot-relevant female characters throughout the entire game. There are a few here and there, most notably the second appearance in the series of Catalina and Kendall Johnson, CJ's sister. But beyond those two, there are really no other major characters, and just the girlfriends that CJ can date, such as Denise who at least gets to be seen in one mission outside of her dates. So we are left with a simple choice, Kendall or Catalina. Well, while this is technically her first appearance in the timeline, I believe it is here, in her second actual game, that Catalina as her own character truly gets to shine. Her appearance in this game also does allow for us to know what she gets up to canonically nine years later in Liberty City so we can consider it when looking at her character as a whole. And in this game, we get to actually spend some time with her, since she isn't an antagonist, but rather one of the many quirky side characters that Carl meets along his journey to rescue his brother and get out of the hood. She is petty, deranged, abusive, and psychotic. In other words, she fits in perfectly in the world of Grand Theft Auto. Catalina clearly has some unresolved issues with men. She mentions a stepfather who may or may not have been physically abusive towards her, and this is one of the many reasons she becomes jaded and bitter towards those assigned male, such as the humble, bumbling protagonists in Carl C.J. Johnson. She is also incredibly possessive. It's heavily implied that she murdered several of her previous boyfriends, and we already know that she goes on to try and kill two more before her karma finally catches up to her. 
since there are not good people in the world of GTA, not really, all we can ever hope for are good characters. And Catalina, while not as complex as I might prefer, is certainly an interesting character to say the least, and thus, to me, plenty good, despite being so bad. Very quickly, checking in on what is perhaps the most forgotten entry in the series, Grand Theft Auto Advance does actually have a story and characters. Not very many, but considering its much smaller cast compared to the main console entries, it is perhaps surprising that it still has at least two noteworthy female characters, something Vice City only just barely managed to do. One of those characters, however, is a returning one in Asuka Kasen. And frankly, she has to be the winner here over the only other one worth mentioning, her niece, Yuka, who appears in a handful of missions. There isn't really much else to say here, and again, GTA Advance has a much simpler story than most other entries, but Asuka is still the best female character in it, meaning that, technically, she's now leading the scoreboard for best in the series, I suppose. And so we come to Liberty City Stories, and yet again, we only have a few really worth mentioning in this next entry, one of which is another returning character. We have Jane Hopper, a union boss whose interests end up conflicting with Salvatore Leone. We have Maria Latour once again, who in this entry seems much less in control and mostly just plays the damsel in distress completely straight. We have the player character, Tony Cipriani's unnamed mother, or simply Mama Cipriani. She is a blatant copy of the character Olivia from The Sopranos. But other than her one known major personality trait, that being that she hates and is strongly disappointed by her son, the player, not much else is known about her. And finally, we have Toshiko Kasen, the sister-in-law to Asuka from GTA 3, and the wife of Asuka and Kenji's older brother, Kazuki. Toshiko is the conniving, betrayed wife who plots to have her husband and leader of the Liberty City Triads murdered by the player. Yeah, LCS's selection is pretty piss poor even with the standards set so low by the rest of the series. So, for my money, the winner is kinda inevitably Maria Latour, since, like Catalina, she can at least count her appearance in three towards her character here, giving her more room to actually be a fully fleshed out human being. Like I said though, her actual appearance in LCS is a lot more damselly and less interesting. Sure, sure. In 3, she does get kidnapped at the end of the game and needs to be saved, but otherwise, she saves Claude at least once and is proactive in her actions, actively torturing one of her lover's new enemies and working alongside Asuka. In LCS, however, all she really does is annoy Tony, who has to look after her until she gets bored and moves on. She doesn't serve as an integral part of the plot like she did in GTA 3, but she's at least a tad bit deeper than either Mama Cipriani or Toshiko, both of whom are about as complex as the level design in a Smash Bros. tournament stage. But LCS's abysmal performance in the category of gender equity is at least followed up by one of the entries in the series, which features some of the most interesting female characters we've yet seen so far, and certainly the most interesting in the 3D era of games, ending with the release of GTA 4 in 2008. I am of course talking about Vice City Stories, which doesn't have a lot of women, but it does have more than the original VC, although that isn't a high bar to clear. We have Janet Vance, the crackhead mother of our protagonist and his brother Lance. We have their never seen in game, but often heard from through the game's pager, Aunt Enid Vance. And then we have Mary Jo Cassidy, and more importantly, her sister, and the most developed female character in the series up to this point, Louise Cassidy Williams. Longtime fans of the channel, or just the GTA series who have actually played VCS, will not be shocked to hear that for this title, Louise wins easily and hands down. She is, as I've said, most certainly the most complicated and well-developed female character in the series at the time of release and set the precedent, whether people played this game or not, for characters like Kate McCreary and Amanda DeSanta later on down the line. 
Louise is a woman who has been abused her entire life. When she was growing up, it was by her father, when she wasn't being perved on by her brother. Then, eventually, it was her husband and the father of her daughter, Mary Beth, Marty J. Williams. However, Louise isn't secretly a great mother and great person who is just being held down by Marty. I mean, Marty is an actual piece of trash and definitely was holding her down, but Louise goes on to demonstrate that her horribly traumatic childhood did not in any way, shape, or form prepare her to be a responsible adult parent whatsoever. She, on more than one occasion, leaves her baby at home alone. And I must really stress this, this is her, from all appearances, less than year old baby. Like, actual infant child who can't walk or do anything. I mean, she appears to only be a few months old for fuck's sakes, and yet she leaves her at home completely unattended while she and her new man go out racing ATVs at a trailer park. She is true white trash. She is, however, also active in her role in the story. She actively moves out of Marty's house with her daughter, and not because of something that Vic says or does. She participates in missions occasionally alongside Vic, such as the one immediately after recovering from a kidnapping herself, which seems to have barely faced her. And most notably, she is literally the reason that Victor goes into Empire Building to begin with. It's her idea for Vic to take over Marty's old business empire, and her encouragement and assistance with things like the prostitution ring that keeps Vic going at first. What makes Louise a truly interesting and well-rounded character is that she is every bit as messed up and full of terrible moral judgments as almost any GTA protagonist, but still manages to hold on to her humanity as she and Vic end up having what is, for me, the most heartbreaking relationship in the 3D era and a serious contender for the best dynamic in the series, even when considering the narrative setup that the HD era saw with the release of GTA 4. Speaking of which, a huge thank you to all of my wonderful YouTube members and my patrons on Patreon.com. And an extra special thank you to my executive producer tier patrons, Mason Collin, Chuck K45, and Die Castinator. Supporters at these tiers also have the option to promote a little bit of their own content, so this video is also brought to you by Mason Collins' podcast channel, We're About Everything, and Chuck K45's Upstart Farming channel, as well as Diecastinator's channel all about diecast cars. YouTube members and patrons will get access to a second series of episodes on the Legend of Zelda series, so if you want to see those too, right now, be sure to sign up at any tier. You can already see the first of these exclusive episodes immediately. I release all videos a little early to all supporters and give you any of the original music tracks created for a given video. You'll also get to see your name in the credits of all videos that are produced while you're pledged, get access to a small patron-only Discord server where you can easily speak with me or see little behind-the-scenes snippets, and most importantly, you'll receive my eternal gratitude. Seriously though, especially these days, those of you who support my work directly are absolutely incredible, and I can't properly express how grateful I am to all of you. Sign up today as a YouTube member, or get slightly better prices at patreon.com forward slash the criminal historian. And now back to the video. Vice City Stories might have had the best character overall so far, but with the arrival of a new generation in GTA 4, we finally saw the other half of the population start to finally have an actual presence in the games, consistently, beyond just being eye candy or prizes to be won, or at least being that exclusively. GTA 4, for the first time, has so many notable female characters that I dare not go through them all, but just to give most of them at least some acknowledgement, we have Gracie Ancelotti, Carmen Ortiz, Kiki Jenkins, Alexandra Chilton, Maureen McCreary, Sarah, Cherise Glover, and of course the heavy hitters in Michelle, Mallory Bardaz, Elisabetta Torres, and of course, Kate McCreary. 
And also Elena Faustin, whom I completely forgot about until I was doing the edit, and it's really sad because she actually might have been a contender for my favorite if only she had had more opportunities to actually be talked to and seen and interacted with in the game. But the one speech she does have with Nico is very impactful. Michelle, whose actual name we eventually learn is Karen, is an undercover IAA agent who is implied to have just been a regular white-collar person at one point, perhaps already involved in law enforcement to some extent, who ends up being indebted to the agency somehow, and, in order to work off that debt, infiltrates an up-and-coming criminal organization through recent Serbian immigrant and the player character, Niko Bellic. Michelle is the first girlfriend the player can date, and she initially comes off as just a woman interested in getting to know Niko, but anyone paying enough attention will pick up on the hints that her interest is less than honest, to say the least. The reveal that she had been monitoring Niko's activity for some time in order to confiscate a massive shipment of cocaine that Niko is asked to move for dealer and other major female character, Elisabetta Torres, is the plot twist which closes out the game's second act, sort of, on the island of Bohan. She isn't seen or heard from after she introduces Nico to her boss, the mysterious Agent ULP, but her actions towards Nico go on to be a heavy influence on him becoming jaded by the whole American dream experience. Then we have Mallory Bardaz, Roman Bellic's girlfriend and later wife, who initially works with him as his receptionist at the cab depot. But Mallory is far more capable and resourceful than your average lady picking up the phone. She grew up on the hard knock streets of Bohan, and because of it, made connections to all manner of Bohans and thus Liberty City's underground, which made her more aware of what to expect from most men. Mallory, much like Roman, does apparently cheat on him at one point with Vlad, although since we never see it or hear from her about it, it isn't known if the interaction was entirely consensual and frankly, I never thought that it was, given the power dynamic that Vlad brings to the table. Beyond this one particular blemish, which I frankly don't think is a blemish at all, especially when you think about how Roman behaves, Mallory is a perfect partner to Roman, who frankly does just about everything in his power to demonstrate that he doesn't even deserve her, such as gambling away all their finances, or putting her, himself, or his cousin's lives in danger because of his dangerous habits and acquaintances. Mallory is always ready to help out Nico and Roman at the drop of a hat, helping them to escape Bohan on a dime, and also seems to actively attempt to convince Roman to be better despite his continued relapses. Mallory is a bad bitch, and frankly, I wouldn't ever want to get on her bad side but that goes double for one of her friends from back in Bohan and our next contender for GTA 4's best female character, Elisabetta Torres. Elisabetta is a drug queenpin and one of the few if not the only one in the series. There are other powerful women such as Georgina Chang or even Trevor's mom, but Elisabetta is, as far as I remember, the only powerful drug lord who was assigned female at birth. Now, if this was the list of the best NBs, then Rennie would have also made the list, but they also would have been the only one on the list, so for now we have Liz and her terrifying presence perk. Even little Jacob, a character that is otherwise shown to be scared of next to nothing, is indeed intimidated by Elisabetta, who worked hard over the years to be a strong woman in a man's world and a heavily male-dominated industry where she is constantly undermined and underestimated. She does not screw around though, and will kill just about anybody up to and including childhood friends who annoy her. And on top of being the baddest bitch in all of GTA 4, and by extension its DLCs, she's also some much needed bisexual representation, or at least is strongly implied to be since she's implied to have had a relationship with Marta. Now that I think about it, she's never explicitly shown to have interest in people assigned male, so she could also be just more sapphic representation, I'm not sure. Point is, you don't mess with Liz if you want to live. She's violent, easily angered, and has absolutely zero time for anybody's nonsense. And finally, we have Kate McCreary, the seemingly only innocent member of the otherwise crime-laden McCreary clan, and Nico, the player character's main love interest, following the revelation about Michelle's true allegiances. 
Nico and Kate's relationship is arguably one of the most important and impactful in the series. I mean, they don't even start dating until having hung out multiple times together as completely platonic friends, and their romance develops quite naturally as a result. Kate is cautious after growing up in a household full of rambunctious and violent boys. But also because of that, she seems to have had less than a stereotypically feminine childhood, and thus is fairly easily drawn into the circles of her brothers by proximity, which is how she and Nico began dating to begin with. She is initially very reluctant to even consider her relationship with Nico as serious because of her experience witnessing her brothers and their antics, but she is eventually won over by seeing Nico's hidden compassionate side, and the good man trying desperately to break out of the shell that he forged for himself by tragedy and betrayal. She eventually, potentially anyways, pays the ultimate price for investing in Nico, but that only serves to make her character more interesting, as frankly, I'm not sure I can imagine her and Nico ever truly settling down for any length of time. Maybe at first, but eventually, I think Nico would be drawn back into the life, and she would go on doing as she had always done, cleaning up the messes of the men in her life. But in my humble opinion, my personal favorite female character in GTA 4 most definitely is Mallory Bardaz. I love Kate, I do, but I always enjoyed Mallory a little bit more, and always wanted her to have more of a presence throughout GTA 4's main story. I wanted to put Kate, and I do think she'd come in a close second for me, but Mallory is, for me, just ultimately a little bit more interesting, and certainly plays a more active role in changing her own circumstances, rather than waiting for the world around her to change on its own. Mallory is just the best. Sorry, Kate. But frankly, the whole race was tight in GTA 4 considering the contenders. That is, however, not the case when it comes to GTA 4's first DLC, The Lost and Damned, which really only has two women worth mentioning, one of which we've already discussed. Ashley Butler, the player character Johnny Klebitz's drug addict, on-again, off-again girlfriend, and Elisabetta Torres making her second appearance on the list. Well, no prizes for guessing, but Elisabetta takes the cake here. Ashley Butler did also appear in the base game of GTA 4, but she didn't do a whole lot in that game, but in this one, she actively plays a role in being the player character's primary weakness, since the two used to be together, and have known each other since they were both very young, at least I'm pretty sure that's implied. It's not that Ashley isn't an interesting character, but she is a one-note one. She is a drug addict, and that is effectively her entire personality as presented in the game. She very clearly cares about and or loves Johnny Klebitz in her own screwed up kind of way, but, but she never gets much of an opportunity to truly shine, as her role in the DLC is to be a sort of tertiary antagonist almost. Whereas the clear winner for this entry, Elisabetta, well, you've already heard all about her. Her appearance in this entry doesn't really warrant a second description though, since it takes place at the same time as the base game, and thus features the exact same characters. However, here, her competition is much less fierce, allowing her to comfortably walk away with the title of Best Female Character in The Lost and Damned. But moving on to the second GTA 4 DLC, and we suddenly have far fewer choices. After all, this was the Ballad of Gay Tony, and in this context, Gay referred to mostly the gay cis man scene, so there was perhaps unsurprisingly not a lot of females around and somehow I doubt we'll ever get a Grand Theft Auto the Sapphic Saga, so we'll have to settle for the reduced selection that Ballad gives us when choosing a best female character. We have a number of small-time female characters who appear very briefly in one-off celebrity missions or as flings for Louise, but in terms of actual full-on characters, we really only have Gracie Ancelotti and the player character's mother, Adriana Lopez. And much like with Catalina or Asuka Kassen, Gracie Ancelotti wins here pretty handily since she has very little competition. She's a character who gets to benefit from having been in the base game, where she is shown to be a stereotypically rich mob daughter, but it's here in Ballad of Gay Tony where she is fleshed out at least a little bit. She is shown to have a real and strong relationship with Tony Prince, and they both care for each other's safety a great deal. And while she's still plenty annoying and certainly not a good person, this is Grand Theft Auto, so who really cares? I'm not really sure what you were expecting. 
The only other option would have been Mama Lopez, who only appears in three missions total, where she demonstrates that she too is mostly just a walking stereotype who is unreasonably critical of her male children's choices in life. She might have had a better shot if she'd had more opportunities to be developed, but she sadly wasn't, and Gracie, although not as important to the actual plot of the DLC, was. And finally, for now anyways, we come to what is still, at the time of this video's release, the most recent entry in the GTA franchise, with GTA 5. And much like with 4, we have plenty of female characters to look at this time around, many of whom are integral to the main plot. I mean, none of the GTA games pass the Bechdel test, but still, at least we have options. There's Molly Schultz, the obsessive assistant to our main villain in Devin Weston, Tanisha Jackson, the former love interest of one of our three player characters, Franklin Clinton, Tanya Wiggins, one of Franklin's childhood friends turned crack addict, and we have Franklin's aunt Denise Clinton, who actively hates most of the men in her life, including her nephew, though I can't imagine why. There's also Patricia Madrazzo, Mrs. Thornhill, Poppy Mitchell, Mary Ann Quinn, Trevor's own mother, and, of course, the wife and daughter of one of our other player characters, Michael DeSanta, in Amanda and Tracy DeSanta, respectively. GTA V easily has the most female characters out of any game in the series, even if not a ton of those are main characters or heavy hitters. But if GTA Online is included, which, for the sake of this video, it's not, there would be even more potential candidates such as Georgina Chang or Imani. But I won't bore you by going over absolutely everyone because, for one, there are just too many. Instead, I'm going to focus on Molly, Tanisha, Tanya, Denise, Amanda, and Tracy. Molly is a corporate stooge and delusionally devoted to one of the worst possible types of men on planet Earth. So, unfortunately for her, since I'm the one making this list, she most certainly won't be taking home the title of Best Female Character. Tanisha, too, has far too little actual screen time for her to truly be competitive, even if her actual role as a motivator for Franklin does arguably affect the plot significantly. Really, the competition here comes down to Tanya, Denise, Amanda, or Tracy, and quite frankly, they're all interesting in their own ways. Tanya is a perpetual hood rat who grew up in, still lives in, and probably will die in the hood. She spends most of her time with her cracked-out boyfriend, JD, and when she isn't with him, she's trying to find someone, usually Franklin Clinton, to cover one of his shifts at his tow trucking business. Which means, even if she isn't actively working for the money the two need to survive, she is the one actively putting in the effort to keep them alive, while JD presumably sits on his ass at home. And despite her less than fiscally responsible nature, she also seems to have an actual good judge of character, and the ability to exercise sound judgment, should she want to. She just rarely wants to. Honestly, I think Tanya is actually way smarter than she lets on, and intentional commentary or not, it's the nature of her circumstances as a poor POC in the shitty parts of LS that contribute to her inability to escape the cycle and do something with her life. Denise Clinton is portrayed as a stereotypical second-wave feminist type, she grew up in a time and place where women, especially women of color in a predominantly black neighborhood, were rarely treated with any real respect by anybody, especially the mainstream establishment. As a result, she wound up angry and bitter by the time she reached middle age, but perhaps justifiably based on all the nonsense she no doubt lived through, having been born in presumably the early to late 60s. What makes her less sympathetic from the player's perspective is her relationship and treatment of the player character, Franklin Clinton, whom she views as a layabout leftover of her now dead sister's failed relationship. She views his bad habits of doing illegal work like repos for Simeon Yatarian or gang work with his best friend Lamar Davis as inherently destructive and dangerous, and constantly chastises him for not making smarter decisions. She is more often than not completely accurate in her assessment of situations, but nonetheless comes off as unsympathetic due to her crass, often very rude method of communication, and her general standoffishness, especially towards people assigned male at birth. Then of course we have the two main women in Michael's life, his wife Amanda and his daughter Tracy. 
Amanda is a woman who worked hard to try and create a better life for herself and her family, but ultimately had to work with what she'd been given after making the unfortunate choice to love a man who was always more in love with robbing banks and boosting his ego than he was ever going to be with his actual family. She's portrayed as an almost bad guy given her cheating on Michael, but if Michael goes to the therapy in-game, it can be brought up just how much of a hypocrite he is for getting as upset as he did and does about this given his own sexual proclivities towards prostitutes. Amanda, though, is a very sympathetic character to me personally. She actually reminds me of someone I know in real life, and I'm sure that contributes towards my preference, but the biggest blemish against her, as far as I'm concerned, is the leeway she affords Michael, and frankly, the fact that she gets back with him at the end of the game. Sure, narratively, it's fine for the actual game, but if these were real people, I'd have told Amanda to take her kids and run like hell a long time ago, if only for the sake of her kids. Which brings me to my final candidate for GTA V, Amanda's daughter, as well as the daughter of one of our player characters, in Michael, Tracy DeSanta. Now, Tracy is actually, I think, secretly the smartest person in the DeSanta family. She has a few moments here or there where I swear to God, the veil drops, and she inadvertently lets on that she's way smarter than she behaves, but she has learned that living in America, and especially LA or LS, she doesn't have to try nearly as hard. And while her father might not be some corporate stooge who can pull the right strings to get her what she wants, he can pull some other strings to achieve the same goals. So I think Tracy could potentially be a very interesting character if we see her in GTA 6 and she's done some more development. But as it stands with her appearance in 5, she just doesn't have enough to go off of to make her more interesting to me than her mother. So ultimately, it came down to a question of who do I find more interesting between Tanya, Denise, and Amanda. Well, as much as I want to pick Denise, she just isn't given enough or nearly as many opportunities for character development as Amanda is, and thus she can't really compete. So yes, Amanda takes the victory here as the most interesting female character to me, in GTA V's story mode anyways. Like I said, I won't be covering GTA Online though, as it's simply too vast, and I don't have the time or interest in acquiring all the necessary footage myself. Anyways. So, ultimately, who is the very best female character in the whole series? At least in my opinion. Well, I think it is perhaps no shock for older fans of my channel, but I think for me the answer is ultimately Louise Cassidy Williams, hands down. She is one of the only women in the entire series with what feels like a full character arc. She goes from timid trailer trash mama to irresponsible crime wife to tragic life lesson, and I only wish she'd been given more opportunities in her one appearance to really shine. To this day, one of the only moments in the entire Grand Theft Auto series which pretty consistently brings me to tears is her death towards the end of GTA VCS, which also provides the best incentive for taking down the final baddies in almost any game with the only real competition being GTA 4's death of Roman or Kate. Speaking of Kate, it really was a tough competition for me ultimately between her and Louise, but Louise, despite technically having less screen time since GTA 4 had a full-on dating system with several unique interactions between her and Nico, Louise still comes out as more sympathetic, more charismatic, more interesting, and just generally more real to me. Not that Kate wasn't real, but I love that Louise is both sympathetic and also a piece of shit just like the male characters around her. Not nearly as much, sure, but still an overall mess who it makes perfect sense to see alongside such men as Lance or Victor Vance. As I said in the intro, there is a lot, and I do mean a lot, I could say about Grand Theft Auto's relationship with women, and perhaps I will if that's something enough people seem interested in. So if you want to see that video, a full-length documentary-style analysis of the role that women have played throughout the series, and how that role has changed, consider signing up today at any tier on my Patreon, at patreon.com forward slash the criminal historian, or sign up today as a YouTube member for all the same perks. About a year from now, we will finally be playing a GTA game as a woman, for the first time in the series, and I can only hope that Lucia, finally receiving the protagonist treatment, will become my and your new favorite female character across this series. 
but I'm also holding out hope that the trend we saw of more women in each entry will only continue, and that maybe, just maybe, we'll even get some actual, decent, explicit queer women representation, but a girl can only dream. Until next time, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you have yourself a wonderful evening. Bye-bye!